Hey, grab your Bibles, will you? Grab them. Turn to the book of Proverbs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, um, about a 40-minute message and turn it into 20 minutes. And if you believe that, I will be uh, selling you some land that's beautiful down in central Florida and a bridge in... Okay, anyhow. Um, turn to Proverbs chapter 6. We're, I just want to share just a couple moments, so... Proverbs chapter 6, you know, um, in, in my family, um, hate is a strong word, right? I even try to, when I hit, catch my girls saying, oh, I hate this, I hate that, oh, let's just save hate for important things to hate, you know, like the devil, and like sin, like lettuce, I mean, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> stuff like that. They tried to sneak, they tried to tell me the other day at a restaurant, we were eating a burger, and I ordered it, mine, you know, I'm like, only if it comes from an animal, or it is an animal, I want it on my burger. You know, it's like, okay, if cheese, okay, I'll have that. Bacon, great. Um, uh, burger, great, okay. But if it's anything else, on, and I know they slipped a piece of lettuce on there, and then they're like, oh, he doesn't want lettuce, because I could taste the juice. <laughs> it doesn't matter how, how much you smother that thing in ketchup, which is a tomato, so I guess I'll take some of that, but lettuce juice, I hate lettuce on my burgers. But anyhow, um, whether, but I, I, I try to... It, Girls, let's just, you know, because my house is full of girls. I'm like, let's try to make sure that hate is used. Because I want to be known for not what I hate, but for what I love. I love Jesus. I love people. I love seeing Jesus change people. I love, um, I love a whole lot of stuff. But you, you understand what I'm saying? But, so, so when I'm reading the book of Proverbs, like many of you are, and, you know, remember every day we're taking one chapter, the chapter of the day, we're reading that. As many of you, when I read the book of Proverbs and I get to chapter 6 and I see that God hates something, I, I just, I can't help but to um, just step back and say, whoa, if God hates something, then what, what's that say to me? I mean, is there anything I need to learn from this? Uh, verse uh, 16, he says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. I can, I can just imagine there's six things that God hates. No, no, there are seven things, seven things that God hates. No, no, he doesn't just hate them. Um, he, they're detestable, that's it, that's the ticket. There are seven things that God not only hates, but they're detestable to him. And he says this, a haughty eyes, verse 17, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among the brothers. Now there's not a whole lot of fill in the blanks till we get to the fourth point, but I really want to encourage you, grab your notes and follow along as I read some of these scriptures as they'll be on your notes and not on the screen. First thing is this, ready? Haughty eyes. Haughty eyes. The King James Version, believe it or not, I think helps clarify a little more what we're talking about. We're talking about a proud look. The message translation says something to the effect of eyes that are arrogant. Arrogant eyes. Let's just, pride, let's just state this. Pride and arrogance, it's detestable to God. He can't stand it. He can't stand it at all, according to Scripture. Proverbs 3.34 says, He mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 13.10, pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 16.5, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Proverbs 16.18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. What is pride? I, I, I try to think of the most basic explanation of pride that I could come up with. And, I, and what, where I landed was this. It's self-worship. Worshiping myself. Now, I'm not saying like you set up a shrine in your bedroom and it's just a, a picture of you with candles around your picture. and oh, I'm, not, I'm not saying necessarily worship like that, but by your actions, you're like, I can do that better than they can. I can do that better than... God can. God, I don't need your help in this one area because I got that pretty much covered. You know, you know what I'm saying? Pride is, is thinking that I, I am strong enough to do it on my own. The other week I was, 
I was, actually it was a couple months ago, I was at a, um, a, a breakfast with a bunch of other guys that weren't from Pathway, and, and, but one of them has a, has a construction business, and, and man, just every word out of his mouth was just downing, because he's having a hard time getting his business to keep going, and everything is just downing every other construction company you could think of, and I'm thinking, that, my friend, is pride. That, my friend, is sick, and that will eat you alive. And it will destroy you on the inside. So I ask the question, though. It it doesn't just say pride. It says haughty eyes. It talks about your eyes. Is there something to the eyes being mentioned? You know, in Matthew chapter 12, or 6, excuse me, it says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. And then it goes on to say, but if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? There's something, something to the eye being the front door to what happens in your spirit and on the inside of you, in your heart. Let me say that again. There's something to your eyes being the front door to what happens in the rest of your life. That's what the Bible's saying. It's like, it's, it's, it, that's where that stuff comes. And, and so I, I'm, I, the more I thought about this, the more I tried to complicate it and see something deeper in this, you know, the eye and the retina and the pupil, and it represents this and blah, blah. No, 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 I don't think so. I, I, I try to complicate it, but this is what I come down to. Pride starts the moment you let the enemy use your eyes to allow something into your heart. Pride starts the moment you or I allows the enemy to allow something in your eye, and then you, it gets in your heart, it gets in your mind, starts working its way. Let's just let's talk about that. It's, pride doesn't start when you refuse to, to, to submit to your boss. Pride doesn't start when you rebel against your boss. Your boss tells you to do it and do it this way and, this, and that's what you expected. And you're like, no, I'm not going to do it. And whether they know about it or not, that's pride. Because why? You think you can do it better. Now, if you think you can do it better, then talk to them about it. But if they say, no, do it my way, then they're the boss. You got to do that, right? Okay, so, so pride doesn't start with that action. Pride starts when you see something. Pride starts in your eyes and it works its way. Let's um, think about this. Um, pride doesn't start with you committing a sin because you think you won't get caught or it's really not as big of a sin as what some may think it is. No, pride starts the moment you see something and you allow it to, to, to make its way into your heart. Um, let's just talk about this. Pride starts the moment you let, you let the enemy use your eyes. So for instance, ladies. Uh, I'm, I've never been a lady. <clears throat> I don't know if you noticed that or not, but um, this is what I know, is some of you really struggle with image. And, and, and whether you like it or not, often what you find yourself doing is through your eyes, you're looking at other ladies and you're saying, well, their hair is not, or my hair is not, or um, uh, my outfit, or my this, or my... You're comparing, comparing, and what it really comes down to at times is pride. Well, at least I don't, I'm, uh, at least my hair is better than her, at least my, whatever it is, my shape, whether it's a pear or an apple or an orange or whatever it comes down to, I, I don't even know what, what it is, but what, whatever it is, you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's not just, I just, I'm just a lady and ladies are that way. No, it's pride if you start to think that, yeah, at least I don't look as bad as they do, or something like that, you understand what I'm saying? Or maybe it's at work. We're at school and there's a project everyone's working on and, and you, you do your part. You know, I think there is a healthy pride. I think there's, there's a, there's a, there, there is a, a good pride where you, where you do something, you accomplish it. Man, that felt good to accomplish that, you know? Felt great a couple days ago to take the dirt and fill all those holes that Daisy the dog dug up in the backyard. I mean, it's like making a tunnel to our neighbor's basement, I think, at one point, under their fence and fill those up. Now, that, that, that healthy pride turned to outright anger when Daisy decided to dig them all up again. But there for a moment, there was a healthy pride, a sense of accomplishment. So maybe you're working on a project and, 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 and there, there ought to be a sense of pride. Yeah, I did a good job. But maybe you look at your part and say, well, my part's just a little bit better than theirs. And maybe everyone else is never as good as yours. And what is that? Well, let's just call it what it is. It's pride. And, and, and as, you, as you begin to look at other ladies, 
As you begin to look at other people and you begin to compare them, it's through the eye gate, it's haughty eyes, prideful eyes, that pride begins to set into your heart. So what's God say about this? The Bible says God hates it. He absolutely hates it. You, you ever notice how you can just read people's faces? You, you can look at them and, and you know, they, they can be excited. Uh, you just look at their eyes. They can, you can be angry, you know. Um, uh, it, it, you, if you're a kid, or you can remember when you were a kid, um, you remember when your parents could just look at you and you're like, <gasps> no, I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, you didn't even have to say a word. For my dad, it was typically a flick on the ear. I mean, it's like, we'd be sitting in church and I'd be messing around or whatever and he'd just reach over and go, just right on the air. Oh, and you knew I better straighten up right away, you know. I was a good kid, though. I didn't get in trouble too, too often, but is that pride? Lord, forgive me. <laughs> Here's the deal, though. God hates pride. God hates pride. I, God hates when, when, when just you can even, un, just people with arrogant, you know, nose up in the air. You see people like that. God, God detests that. Now, I'm not saying God hates that person, but I think it's, what the Bible is definitely saying is God hates that action. What's the second thing he says? By the way, I can't get through all seven of these this morning. Just, I already planned coming into this service that we're going to talk about this more next week. But um, number two, second thing is this. God hates a lying tongue. Proverbs 12, says this. Look in your notes. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. Proverbs 30, verse 9, this is a, this is a proverb of Agur. Two things I ask of you, O Lord, do not refuse me before I die. These two things, he says, more than anything, this is what I want. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Whoa, stop for just a second. Have you ever thought of praying that? I mean, I don't know as if I've ever prayed that necessarily, but I think that's a great thing to add to our prayer list, am I right? God, would you just keep falsehood and lies, all the drama, all the stupidity of blah, 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 lying and gossiping. And God, would you just keep that far from me? As you approach your week this week, I want to encourage you to pray that prayer. And let's see what God does. Maybe it's at work or at school, or, or you're not in school right now, but maybe you're in summer school. But wherever it's at, whatever you're doing, just say, God, just keep me from the drama, will you? Keep me from all the, the slander, the lying. God, I don't even want to hear it. Keep falsehood and lies from me. This is the challenge with this, though. Some people are so used to being, used to being careless with the truth, lying, that they, sometimes they don't even realize they're doing it. You know someone like that? Don't point fingers. But, you know, someone, just, they're just so used, it's just so, they're making that situation look better than what it really is. Is that sin? Is that wrong? Is there such thing as a white lie? You know, it's, a, it's an okay lie. I'm not talking like you're having a surprise party, you're not telling somebody about it. But um, uh, I'm talking about is there such thing as a, as, a, as a not a big deal lie? Let me tell you about a time I lied. You're all like, really? Cool. <laughs> is this being recorded? Um, it, it, it was seemingly something so stupid. But I was selling a car. And some of you heard me tell the story before. I was selling the cars, my, my prize car. It was a 1987 um, uh, Pontiac Grand Am. Uh, it was Pontiac, so it had the orange interior, and it, it had a CD player changer in the back, and then Air Cruise, the, 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 the whole bit. I mean, it, it was my love. I fell in love with that car, but it was, it was time to sell it again. It's a really cool story, but I sold it twice. Okay, so I'm selling it again. And this gal comes and says, you know, you just buy the car. And says, Can I drive it? Yeah, drive it, but don't take it over 40 because it won't downshift. So, so, um, but she, she ended up giving me 500 bucks for it. And I'm just thinking, okay, I am not a car salesman. I'm not good at this. This is what I want. I want the money in my hand and you to be gone. I mean, that's pretty much what I'm like. I don't, I, don't wanna, I, don't, I don't want you to ask me any more questions. It's as is. I didn't lie to her about anything else, but I was just like, the, the money in my hand and you gone. That's what I'm thinking. And so she just, on a whim, she just says, um, okay, do you have any extra sets of keys? I'm like, oh, no, 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 here's a set of keys, money, and get out of here. No lie. Almost as soon as, I, no sooner did I say that, but Megan comes out of the front door. Hey, Scott, here's my set of keys. <laughs> Isn't there something in the Bible about women being silent in the house? <laughs> Or is that the church? And maybe that's a misinterpretation, but get back in the house, woman. 
I mean, that's, that's what it kind of rose up inside of me. And I was like, oh, thank you. Here's an extra set of keys. Give me your money. I'll get out of here. Okay, and then she left. And I go in the house and I'm steaming. I'm just like, man, I can't believe you came out. And she's like, are you kidding me? You lied to her? I'm like, but I can't believe you did what you did either. <laughs> you know, I, I laugh about that. But God taught me a very important lesson on that day. That even those little seemingly insignificant lies, would have it really, I mean, hurt her to go to the hardware and pay 50 cents a key for a key? No, 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 no. But that was, that was integrity, right? You know what God says? God's word says, I hate a lying tongue. The ninth commandment, for goodness sake. Exodus chapter 20, you don't have to turn there. But this encompasses all forms of lying when it says, don't give false testimony against your neighbor. Why is this such a big deal? Why is lying such a big deal? Well, I think, I think the big thing, and there's a lot of things I could say, but I think it's betrayal. When you lie, you betray faith. When, when, if I were to lie to you, you, you have a faith in me. You have a trust in me. If, when you lie to someone you love or someone you work with, you're betraying the trust that you've built there. That's why after someone lies to you, all of a sudden it takes a long time, am I right, to regain trust that you can ever believe that person again. God hates lying, absolutely hates it. I think about Abraham, um, and I was going to have you turn there, but don't worry about it. It's, it's in Genesis chapter 8, but you remember Abraham? He's the dude that's like the, 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 the man of faith. I mean, the father of faith. Father Abraham had many sons. I, I, I sang songs about Father Abraham in kids' church growing up, right? This is the father of faith. But what does he do after God has this, just, does this real amazing, amazing thing? In, in, in Genesis chapter 12, it says this. It says, now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. And as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, um, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife. Then they're going to kill me, but we'll let you live. Say, I don't know. Say you're my sister, will you? It's in the Bible. This is what Abraham said, so that will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. And you can read on later on what happens then. But Abraham lied. He lied. And the, the amazing thing is he is in the midst of accomplishing God's will and plan for his life, and right in the middle he lies. Hello. God hates it. Now you go, this is why I want to use Abraham as, a, as an example. And this is what I want you to get. Jason's convicted about him. <laughs> He's going out. I had to figure, I'm sorry. Okay, but, but here, here's, here's the deal. Abram, Abraham, Abram, Abraham was the, the father of faith. This is a guy who is just touted as, this guy had it going on. Great man of faith. But yet, in a time of weakness, what did he do? In a time of fear, what did he do? He lied. So let me just say this. This temptation is not beyond you. you can, when I say God hates lying, oh yeah. God, you must really hate that person, or hate what that person does and that person. No, you think about yourself. Don't think that you're not above lying. I mean, what, what, what if I was trying to win that gal to Jesus? Well, yeah, what do you do? Well, I'm a pastor. Oh, really? Well, I know you want to buy my car, though. Let's talk about it. Well, I'm just really hurting right now, and I'm, I'm trying to win her to Jesus, and then I end up lying to her about the car keys. That would have been real credible, wouldn't it? Um, okay, so, so it can happen to anyone. That's what I want you to get. I want you to get. So guard yourself, because God hates liars. It, it's betrayal. I, 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 I'm going to say one more thing and we're going to move on, but it was, a, it was a beautiful day. I heard the story. It was a beautiful day and four students decided to um, uh, kind of take their time, get into class, and they're driving around. It was a beautiful day. One of them had a convertible, so they're driving around enjoying the day, and, and they get back, and they walk in, and the teacher is like, where have you guys been? It's like, oh, we had, a, we had a flat tire. Yeah, a flat tire, a flat tire. We had a flat tire. And so um, we had to fix the tire, and, it took, and the teacher's like, okay, okay. And the kids thought they had won. They, these students thought, oh. And the, and, the, and the teacher said, but one thing, we, we did have a quiz today, and I need all of you to take this quiz. And they're like, oh, no problem. So he, she says, go into four different corners of the room. So all four kids go into four. And she said, this is the one question on this quiz. Which tire was it? Okay, God hates liars and so do teachers, right? Any teachers here? Amen. The next thing Proverbs says is God hates hands that shed innocent blood. The message translation says it this way, hands that murder the innocent. God hates it. 
He hates hands that murder the innocent. People that knowingly and willingly murder others. God hates that. Now, this definitely covers all of our uh, um, thousands of prisoners that have murdered people all over the United States. Now, I want to remind you, God, God doesn't say he, he hates murderers, because God loves everybody, right? But God says, I hate people that shed innocent blood, people that, that, that murder other people. I think th- this definitely covers that. God hates that act. What about this? What about World War II? Um, the extermination of the Jews, if you will, the killing, the murdering of the Jews, Auschwitz and other concentration camps like this. Can you imagine what was going on in God's heart it, during World War II when they were exterminating all those people? I mean, it, 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 I'm assuming all of you studied this in like sixth and seventh grade, but if you haven't, you ought to read up on it because um, uh, you know, sometimes history repeats itself and God forbid that would happen, but you know, millions of people just eliminated from uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands, just eliminated from, from life just for one thing, for being Jewish. I mean, that's, was God's heart not just these innocent, innocent people murdered? Can you think of any, any other, other things modern day where people are murdered innocently? yeah. Abortion. Or some like to call it termination of a fetus. Sounds a lot nicer that way. But um, uh, at, at, w- what I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches, is that at conception is where life begins. And let me say something before I say anything more. If you've had an abortion in your past or even recently, I just want you to know there's forgiveness and there's love. God, God doesn't say he hates the person Um, but he says he hates that act. Every time there's an abortion done in the world, I think God's in his heart just like, oh, oh. There's forgiveness for you, but let me just say this. Abortion is murder. Um, You know, I I, I read a book recently by this guy named Todd Burpo. He's a pastor, and his son, uh, Colton. Um, It's called Heaven is for Real. Now, let me just say, I, I, every book that I've ever read or, or heard talked about, about um, heaven, someone dies and has a, a death experience where they go up to heaven or hell, wherever it may be, I always take it with a grain of salt. I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm just like, yeah, really? Yeah, come on. And I think part of it is because there's some people that will read a book on uh, someone's experience in heaven, and all of a sudden they make theology out of it and say, oh, yeah, well, the, 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 the houses do look like McDonald's in heaven, and because they went to heaven, and they, you know, or whatever, whatever it may be. I'm just always a little cynical of it. So I'll be honest, someone told me, you really got to read this book, and I ended up listening to it um, on the way down to Indianapolis and back, and if you get a chance, it'd be a great book for you to read. Um, it's called Heaven is for Real. But... Um, But the more I listen to this kid's story, the more I think, wow, I think something really did happen. And I think this kid had had this experience where he was in the midst of emergency surgery, slipped out of consciousness, and and he had this experience in heaven. And it was weeks, I think, maybe even a month later, when he just started talking about, well, yeah, when I was having surgery, this is what happened. And, and, And he starts detailing things about heaven that only, um, uh, only if you were there could you see. I mean, right down to relatives and right down. I mean, if you've never read it and you're skeptical, so was I. Read it and then you tell me what you think. But this is, this is the thing that got me. This kid was four years old. Four, one, two, three, four, four years, four fingers, four years old. He had no idea that his mom and dad had had a miscarriage, that his mom had had a miscarriage. And when he got to heaven... He met his sister, and he talks. This little kid, that they've journaled everything he said. He said, um, uh, Mom, I met my sister who, who, um, uh, who died in your tummy. And there's a whole section on it where he talk, starts, this kid's four years old. He doesn't even know what a miscarriage is. I mean, all he knows is his sister died, and, mom, and he meets his sister. Okay, so I'm not saying we need to build theology out of this book. But what I am saying is this, is that seems to affirm the very thing we see in Scripture. The fact that Psalms 139 verse 13, for you created me in my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Hello, isn't that powerful? That God, his hands were involved in creating my handsomeness? That's obvious, right? That's absolutely obvious. But no, that God was creating me in my mom's womb. God was there. He was a part of that work. Hello? 
You think about Jeremiah 1, 4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the, new, in the womb, I knew you. Who formed you in the womb? God did. Listen, guys, I, I just want to make sure you get this. We don't, we don't ra- wave the banner of, of a lot of different things in our church. We mostly just, let's focus on Jesus and get people saved and let the scripture change. I mean, that type of thing. But, but that does not mean that we don't take a hard stance against certain uh, moral issues such as abortion. It is the shedding of innocent blood and God help us to know about um, uh, something like this and not do anything about it, right? So let me just encourage you, you take it from there, but this is what we know, God hates it. Hates it, his heart cringes, I know, when there's someone who is innocently murdered or killed. Let me share the fourth thing and then we'll, we'll conclude. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you don't sit around thinking about um, evil schemes every day. You know, it's like doofenshmirtz. I mean, how, I'm going to take over the whole tri-state area. And um, if you don't watch Phineas and Ferb on the Disney Channel, you ought to every once in a while. Um, not all the time, just every once in a while. And, um, uh, uh, and, and, but but I'm, I'm thinking about my, my younger kids. I, mean, I love that whole Phineas and Ferb thing and, and the, the tri-state area. But m- make sure you notice this. Um, is that uh, where the wicked scheme comes from? A heart that devises wicked schemes. A heart, a heart, a heart. It's in your heart. You know, I, I just, I just want to take a moment and just talk about your heart because Proverbs 4.23, it says this, Above all else, guard your heart. For why? Why, why guard my heart? What's the big deal? Because it's the wellspring of life, right? It's the wellspring of life. Um, Michael Hyatt, this guy's the chairman of Thomas Nelson Publishers, and I, um, every once in a while I actually visit his blog, and I saw, I saw he said some, shared some thoughts on, on the heart. I thought, man, this is good. Let me just throw this out to you real quick. Fill this in your notes, will you? First thing, um, three thoughts on why, why it's necessary to guard your heart. Why is your heart so... Because, first of all, your heart is extremely valuable. Do you guard things that aren't valuable? Like Tuesday nights, I roll the old blue cart out to the street corner and I set it right there because most of the time on Wednesday morning, I'll forget. So Tuesday night, I roll out the trash. I let it sit there all night Tuesday, all morning till the trash comes at 8 o'clock or whenever it comes. I, I could care less. I mean, someone wants to rummage through my trash, go right ahead. Well, not literally. I mean, stay out of my trash. But here's the deal. So I've been known to sit in my, in my upper stairs room with a BB gun. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I shouldn't joke about that. But, uh, okay, my trash is just, I could care less about my trash sitting at the, um, I, I don't guard my trash. But, you know, when we go to sleep, we lock every door in the house, deadbolt. You know why? Because what's in my house, my kids, my wife, my dog most of the time, it's It's important. We guard that stuff, right? We shut the garage door. We guard that stuff because it's important. Why should I guard my heart? Because it's important. It's extremely valuable. What happens in your heart is what sets the tone for the rest of your life. You know this, but let me just remind you. Um, Just like your physical body, if your heart, your spiritual heart dies, your spiritual health dies with it. See what I'm saying? Um, Okay, let's move on. Second thought, because your heart is the source of everything you do. Guard your heart. Guard it. Don't get bitter. Don't get, if you find yourself getting bitter, you find yourself getting angry, you find yourself holding on to something, just guard, just say, God, help me. God already knows you're struggling. Don't try to hide it from him. Don't try to hide it from him. Just say, God, okay, here it is. I lay it out before you. Help me on this one. Help me on this one. Guard your heart because your heart is the source of everything. You know, um, uh, Megan and I, uh, one time, uh, in fact, when we were going to start the church, we went to this thing, this boot camp thing for church planners. You've heard me talk about it before, but it's in Colorado Springs or near Colorado Springs. Um, and we, we spent a couple days in Colorado Springs. I remember going up in the mountains and, and as, we're, as we're traveling up, there was, it was the funniest thing because the windows were down and we're enjoying it, nice day. And all of a sudden we see this um, uh, sign says something about bears all throughout this area. And Megan's like, she can't roll, it's a manual. She can't roll her window up quick enough. It was great. And, and, uh, and, and so we see those signs, but then right next to those signs is the wa- don't contaminate the water. Something to do with the water. We're up in the mountains. There's these streams coming out of the mountains out of nowhere. And they're like, 
like these streams feed the water system for all of Colorado Springs. Please don't pollute, don't, don't, don't do anything because this is important water. And why do they do that? Well, if you pollute the water there, the whole rest of the water is going to get polluted, right? If you, if you, if you do things to that water... Um, it's going to mess things up for everybody. And that's the same thing out of your heart. It's the wellspring of your life. If your heart is bitter, if your heart is, is, is negative all the time, if your heart has issues, <laughs> then it's going to affect everybody. It's going to affect your marriage. It's going to affect your kids. It's going to affect your school. It's going to affect your work. Everywhere you go, guard your heart. It says it's, it's a source of everything you do. The third thing is this, because your heart is under constant attack. Why would scripture say you ought to guard it if there wasn't something coming after it? You know what I'm saying? Now, I just just want to drill this in here. You're going to have to walk out some specific ways that you can guard your heart, whatever those may be. But but, um, uh, Solomon um, was speaking some real wisdom here because Satan uses all kinds of weapons to attack our heart. Right? He wants to take you out. Anything to do with God or someone who's following God, he wants to destroy you. He wants to take you out. And the Bible says, guard your heart. When you allow anger to well up in your heart, when you allow bitterness to well up in your heart, it is sometimes, it's real easy at times to start scheming something evil about whoever made you angry, whoever made you bitter. Man, if they just get a flat tire and I could pass them, oh, that'd be great. Or, man, if, 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 if the boss would somehow find out exactly how they really are at work, oh, they'd be fired anyway. Okay, maybe I could coordinate that. I mean, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? When, when, when you allow um, hurt and whatever to, 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 to find a place in your heart, all of a sudden you can see it's real easy. Begin to scheme and begin to think. Um, how could, how could something happen to this person? How could someone happen to their life and to their situation? See, God hates a heart that devises wicked schemes. He hates it. He hates in this church. Have you ever been a part of a church? I pray not this church. Or another entity outside in the community where there are people that are scheming all the time. I mean, you always feel like, man, do you have an ulterior motive here? I mean, let's just do our best to keep that out of the church. We're not a perfect church. So there may be times when any of us will fall to this. But let's not scheme and, and scheme our way into doing anything. Let's just, let's just trust the Holy Spirit and let God's will be done in our church and in, in the lifeblood of this church. You see, these are, these are four things. I'm going I'm to hit the next three next week. But these are four things that God doesn't just say, oh, these really, these really bother me. No, God says, I hate them. They're detestable to me. Absolutely detestable. And I know, um, uh, as, as sometimes it's easy to do, the easiest thing to do when, when you hear a message like this is to start to think about other people. Yeah, they have a problem with that whole lying thing. Yeah, that person, they have, a, they have real issues with this or that. But can I just tell you what our next steps are as we kind of conclude this? Next step, just one step. Look on the screen. Hate these things about yourself. Matthew Henry. Uh, I was reading in his commentary as I was studying this this week. Matthew Henry, Henry's commentary. This is what he said. He said, um, hate these things about yourself. Because it's so easy to look at your spouse or to look at your kids, or look at your mom, your dad, look at people you work with, and just say, yeah, they really needed this message. <laughs> but today, today, right here, right now, this is your next step. I want you to keep reading the Proverbs of the day with us, but this is your next step. Hate these things about yourself. Let the Holy Spirit convict you, even the little white lies. Do you have an extra sp- spare set of keys? No, no s- extra set of keys here. Here's my set of keys, God. Even those little, little, little things. Let's just say, no, I'm going to be a man, a woman of integrity. I'm going to live above that. You know what I'm saying? God hates this stuff. And if he hates it, so do I. 
Now, God created lettuce. I'm pretty sure that he doesn't mind that. But, I, I, but God, this stuff, God hates, and I will join him in that. Let's stand. Come on, let's stand. Let's pray. Worship team, would you come? God, it's been so good to be with you today. And Lord, I thank you that you're not done yet. God, I thank you that in the next few moments, you're going to seal the deal of this message, if you will. God, I thank you that there are people in this room that you love enough to lead me to preach a series on Proverbs and talk about the things that you hate. God, you hate haughty eyes, eyes that are prideful. Mm, You don't like that. Hands that shed innocent blood, you don't like that. God, all of these things, God, you, 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 the the wicked schemes, people that sit around just scheming, uh, the lying tongue, you hate these things, God. And therefore, we hate these two. And God, we we vow to you today that we're not just going to sit back and think about others, but right now, we're going to make this personal. And God, I thank you that you love us enough to bring us here today to hear this word. And now we're going to respond to that word, God. God, right now, show us in our heart. Is there anything in our heart that that we just kind of look over? Have we been scheming? Have, Have we been lying? Just little things here and there. Not a big deal, just little things. Any of these things, God, is there anything? Are we are we prideful? God, we just, we got to fight that because we know that's not of the Spirit of God. That's of the Spirit of man and the flesh. And so God, we just ask today that you'd help us with these things, Lord. In Jesus' name. Would you just keep your eyes closed for just a second?